Hello there, Extra. How are you doing tonight? Hello there, Echo Tourism. Welcome, welcome. Started here in about a minute and a half. Meanwhile, what you're listening to is you're listening to Stream Beats. It's uh, music by streamers for streamers, compiled by Harris Heller, put out under the Stream Beats label. Uh, guaranteed to never get a copyright strike on your stream on Twitch or on your YouTube videos that you upload. So we very much thank Harris and the team over at Stream Beats for that music. And also want to say a big shout out to Mo over at the Tabletop Bellhop. Mo is the OG for all things tabletop games. He has a whole galaxy of information about all kinds of tabletop games you could ever want. Board games, party games, card games, tabletop RPGs, you name it. And a whole slew of people doing streaming media, podcasts, things like that about those, every aspect of those games. So with that... We are going to go ahead and turn the music down and flip over to this and say to everybody, welcome, welcome to Monster Monday for April 19th, 2021. I am your host, DM Galabond, and tonight on Monster Monday... We are going to be talking about a special conversion monster. Uh, the monster is Ryuse, the Falling Star, and this is a monster that originally appeared in the Kamigawa block of uh, Magic the Gathering. And when my party visited uh, Kamigawa in my planeswalking game, Ryuse the Falling Star was kind of the climactic encounter of their entire visit. Um, I had a bit of a storyline where uh, one of the side effects of the Kami War 
that happened in Kamigawa was that one of the spirit guardians was corrupted. Uh, chose that to be Ryusei because of a couple of neat different pieces of artwork I found from Wizards of the Coast for that monster. And uh, so I chose that as the corrupted guardian that needed to be healed. And that meant that the party had to fight this monster. So I had to convert it into a monster with a D&D &D stat block so that D&D &D characters could have a combat with it. All right, so let's go ahead and first of all take a look at the monster we're talking about out of Mag Magic the Gathering. So this is Rayusei the Falling Star, a legendary creature, dragon spirit. And this artwork, by the way, um, you'll see a little bit later the other artwork I chose, but this is the artwork I chose for the corrupted version. The uh, reason I chose this one is because of the way it looks like with his plates and scales. It looks like, you know, he's kind of like coming apart or uh, sort of dried and cracked and you can see a bit of the uh, fire underneath the scales um, of the dragon in there so it that looked to me like a good corrupted um, version of a monster and in the game he's a six casting cost creature that requires at least one red mana uh, has flying is a five five creature and then when it dies, it deals five damage to every creature on the board without flying. So, you know, it basically splashes damage all over the board uh, when you when you have this monster out. Uh, now, in my game, uh, Ray say the Falling Star is one of the Dragon Spirit Guardians in the Plain of Kamigawa. Each of these guardians is tied to one of the land types in the Magic the Gathering game. And in the Walker of Waterdeep planeswalking game, the Ryusei has an ancient shrine which is now ruins on the tallest mountain in the plain, which is called Undaitake Peak. Um, and uh, so that's where they had to go to encounter this uh, creature. All right. Now, here is the artwork that I found for the one that I thought uh, would be the uh, cleansed version of Rayusei. Uh, kind of a more brilliant red, a little bit uh, a little bit brighter color and everything like that, and the scale seemingly more um, uh, more sealed up. It's still got kind of the fiery dorsal. Uh, ridge along the back of it and as i was as i was trying to figure out which set this is from i realized uh, this is from the magic the gathering online set so you would never see this this artwork for the card in print in a printed card you would only see it in the uh, digital version of the game so what was the reason behind having them fight this monster? So Kamigawa is a plane that has been embroiled in a war uh, between the Kami of the spirit world and the races of the natural world for two decades. As this war is dragged on, Ryusei has become corrupted by one of the most powerful Oni. Uh, and Oni are uh, demons in the Kamigawa expansion. So the PCs hold the key to restoring Ryusei and healing that corruption. And one of the reasons, uh, as I said, is just I liked the artwork, the two different versions of the artwork. The one looked like a, a good depiction of a corrupted monster. This one looked like a really good depiction of a restored and rejuvenated monster. So that's that's kind of where I where I came from with that. Now, I had to figure out what was going to be the base monster when I, when you're taking a monster out of out of Magic the Gathering or out of any other IP and putting it into D and D. Uh, whenever I customize a monster, I want to do the least amount of work possible. 
So what that means is that means choosing an existing monster from D&D and then just sort of tweaking it around the edges. Uh, for Ryuse, I wanted to start with a red dragon, and then I applied the shadow dragon template, which is also from D&D. And then once I had that, I further customized it to make it feel more like a monster out of Magic the Gathering, and also to make it feel more like it's this epic, uh, this epic creature that they had to fight. So um, when you look at the uh, when you uh, look at the shadow dragon uh, template, damage resistances it has resistance to necrotic damage. Uh, skill proficiency it gains stealth. The dragon's proficiency bonus is doubled for dexterity checks. Living shadow. Uh, while in dim light or darkness, the dragon has resistance to damage that isn't forced, psychic, or radiant. Uh, uh, shadow stealth. While in dim light or darkness, the dragon can take the hide action as a bonus action. Sunlight sensitivity. While in sunlight, the dragon has disadvantage on attack rolls as well as on wisdom checks that rely on sight. Um, and then it's a modification to the bite. Uh, if the dragon deals normally deals uh, acid, cold, fire, lightning, or poison damage with his bite, change that damage type to necrotic. And then a new action for the Shadow Dragon template is Shadow Breath. Any damage dealing breath weapon possessed by the dragon deals necrotic damage instead of the original type. And a humanoid that's reduced to zero hit points by this damage dies and an undead shadow rises from its corpse and acts immediately after the dragon in the initiative count. Shadow is under the dragon's control. So, I looked at that template, and there were some of those things that I said, okay, I'll use other pieces of those things that I will tweak. And what I'm going to do over the next few slides is I'm going to sort of pull back the curtain and let you look at both the stat block and the way I tweaked each of these. Now, keep in mind, my game is a highly homebrew game. And the tweaks that I did worked exactly as intended, which was to make this an epic fight that would push, my, push the PCs that my players have to their very limits and really make them think and plan and not just be able to go in and try to take on this monster without without setting some things up ahead of time. Um, and it worked for my game. But if you took this exact conversion that I did for my game and tried to put it in your homebrew game, then depending on your players, the way I did it, may be way too easy for your players and not pose the kind of challenge you want it to, or it could wind up being way too hard for your players, and it might result in an unintended P TPK. So the, the idea here is not to look at what I did and say, oh, that's the only way there is to... Uh, convert a monster. It's just to sort of see, well, here's my thought process, and here's why I chose the things that I chose. You, knowing your own game and your own players and their characters, would have to figure out what process would work for them. And if you've ever been stuck in trying to figure out how, well, at least this is one way, and then maybe seeing one way will get you to think, ah, okay, Here's here's a maybe a different variation that you can take on that for your game. All right, so uh, now I've got my uh, starting point for the monster, so I need to tweak it for my purposes. What I knew about the fight when I was setting this up is I knew it was going to be a solo monster against a full party. That means that he has to be a clear and present danger to a full group of heroes uh, meant pumping up his hit points, uh, tweaking his immunities, and tweaking his abilities in order to really challenge a party 
that has proven to be a lethal group against multiple spellcasters and powerful tank-like enemies in the past. So, now that's part of the challenge. Now, the other challenge is balance that against the party being only 8th level. So they have a limited number of hit points, and they only have access to 4th level spells. Now, of course, they could buy scrolls of higher level spells, but there would be a chance of failure because of the DC uh, anytime you try to use a higher level spell off of off of a scroll. So I was I was saying guarantee is that they only are going to have access to fourth level spells. And in the party, there's a cleric, a druid, a bard, a barbarian, and a monk all of whom have some potent weapon attacks and access to at least some spells. Um, what? A barbarian has access to spells? Yes. The, there's a, the, he's, taken, he's taken, I think, one level of sorcerer. And um, he also has a, uh, one of the uh, paths uh, or one of the totems that he that he has gives him access to a couple of little spell like abilities so um, I have a pretty good idea how far I can push the party before causing a TPK and I wanted this particular fight to take it right to the edge and as I said it wound up working as I intended all right so here is the primary stat block and um, this is taken out of uh, Roll20, um, which is where we play our game. We play our game in Roll20. So um, here's some of the uh, tweaks that I chose. So number one, the armor class and the, uh, the ability scores, I didn't change those at all. But I did wind up pumping up the HP to 308. Why would I do that? Well the party hits very hard and they really like the satisfaction of seeing big chunks of hit points come off of a powerful monster and um, that's something that's very fun and satisfying for them as players I've, I've learned that they really like that so i like giving them big huge bags of hit points that they can just wail on and they can they can take chunks out of and they get the satisfaction of seeing these big multiple attacks on the same creature but they um but they still have to work to get it down so I also increased the condition immunities to make the monster more of a challenge. Um, so you notice the condition immunities, it's immune to being charmed, poisoned, stunned, petrified, prone, paralyzed, frightened, and incapacitated. Now, there's a reason that I put some of those in there. Uh, there's a favorite tactic the party has that deals with the monk. The monk is kind of the crowd control in the party because what the monk will do is the monk will go up and will um, will do unarmed strikes against an opponent and spend key points to try to get a stunning blow. And when you can stun an opponent, then you basically take that opponent out of the fight until the end of the monk's next turn and so then the monk always has a chance to reapply that stun if the creature uh, fails its saving throw and you can just perpetually keep that monster out of the fight since this is a solo it wouldn't be much of a fight at all if they could just go up punch the thing and stun it and then there's nobody else that they have to deal with and they just wind up chopping on this thing until they reduce it to zero hit points so i wanted to make sure they didn't have that tactic available to them um and there's a couple of other things that the party can do that i wanted just to make sure like uh i wanted to make sure they just they uh couldn't 
use any kind of spells to frighten it or to um, charm it um, or any of those types of things that that they sometimes have the ability to do. Um, the mat damage resistances, uh, I left those at force and cold and piercing, bludgeoning, slashing from non-magical weapons. Uh, the immunities, I made those fire and necrotic because it's uh, it de the monster is red mana which is fire mana from Magic the Gathering. And so it made sense for it to be um, for it to be fire. Also because of that Shadow Dragon template and something that I did with one of those uh, Shadow Dragon features, I felt like the necrotic, leaving that necrotic in there was a, uh, was a good thing. All right. Uh, now, here are... Here's kind of some of the features I gave it, and you'll notice some of these are kind of echoes of the uh, of the Shadow Dragon features, and some of them are completely new and unique to my game. But they are a little bit of twist, and some of those are some of these are just straight up dragon things from D and D. So to make the monster more formidable in its environment, I gave it two features, Living Mountain and Teleport Through Stone. Now you remember Shadow Dragon template has something called Living Shadow. Well, that didn't make a whole lot of sense with this guy. But I said, while this dragon is in contact with Mountain Stone... It has resistance to all damage that is not psychic or radiant. So what that means, in addition to those damage resistances that it normally gets, if it's standing on a mountain stone, or if it's uh, you know in contact with a mountain stone, it's going to take half damage from anything you deal with it. So the most effective tactic you can do is try to get it off of the mountain stone, which either means put something between the dragon and the stone if it's on the ground, or get the dragon up in the air. Another thing to make that, to drive the point home that leaving it on stone is a bad idea, is I gave it a uh, an ability inspired by an earth elemental. And this is called teleport through stone. So while it's in contact with stone, the dragon can teleport to an unoccupied space up to 120 feet away as a bonus action. So what this means is this means that it can, um, uh, instead of the, the Earth Elemental, which has, I think it's called Earth Glide, and that means it can just... Uh, fold down into the stone and then use its movement to move through the stone and then come back up somewhere else. Well, this guy can just simply teleport from one point to another up to 120 feet away as long as he is touching stone. Once again, you put something between the dragon and the stone, you take that away, or you get him up in the air, and then he only has his normal movement abilities, which would be his flying ability. Um, so you, uh, that was another thing I wanted to have them think about, when it's like, how can we get this guy in a point where he's not going to be able to do this all battle long? Now... You remember the shadow dragon template has water sensitivity or has shadow or sunlight sensitivity. Again, that didn't make any sense. This is more of an elemental creature. So I said, let's change that from um, sunlight sensitivity to water sensitivity. So while the dragon is in running or falling water, it has disadvantage on attack rolls as well as perception checks that rely on sight or hearing. So I went ahead and I gave them that because that's a vulnerability that echoes something off of the shadow vulnerability. That's another key or tool that they can use. Ah, if we can get it, if we can get this thing in somehow running water or falling water, we can make it harder for him to hit. Um, to hit us. 
So this is where this is where I threw kind of a bone out there because they have a druid in the party. Well, the druid can do things like sleet storm or uh, tidal wave or stuff like that, which causes water to fall, either frozen water or liquid water, to fall in an area and can catch the monster and then give it that um, give it that water sensitivity uh, feature. All right, so of course, because it's a dragon, it has legendary resistances, and then it has a frightful presence, but the you know there are several ways around that and the characters mitigated that by doing a hero's feast which means they just simply can't be frightened so it's fine that wasn't in there i didn't expect them to fall for that but it was still something they had to plan for and figure out before they went into the fight now here's a here's a thing that i did where i thought back to fourth edition D D and thought about hmm how can I throw a curveball at them? And I had to do a lot of figuring on this. Uh, I had to run a lot of experiments to figure out what gave me the right balance. So I had Conjure Breath of Ryuse. So every time Ryusei the Falling Star uses a breath weapon, there is a 5% chance in each unoccupied square touched by the breath weapon that a breath of Ryusei, which is a creature, is conjured. The breath of Ryusei acts on each turn immediately after Ryusei the Falling Star, including on the turn it was conjured. Breath of Ryusei remains intact until destroyed by damage or until Ryusei the Falling Star dismisses it as a free action. Uh, the third thing, which I didn't put in there, is that if if it if the dragon falls to zero hit points, it also uh, the these Breath of Ryusei creatures will also go away. So uh, these Breath of Ryusei creatures are minions, and that's the fourth edition concept. Uh, and a minion is a creature that only has one hit point. So I tested it with a series of about 100 repeated dice rolls, tweaking that percentage and understanding that the grid, when you do a 60-foot cone, there are 78 5-foot uh, squares in a 60-foot um, cone breath. So I wanted to have a possibility that several uh, creatures would be spawned, but I didn't want it to be a whole lot of creatures. And I tried it at 10%, and I was getting way too many, way too many creatures popping. I was like, okay, that would overwhelm them. Then I tried it like at 2%, and on several tests, it just none of them none of them hit the 2% threshold. So I was like, well, that's not very good. But then I found a sweet spot at 5%, and it would average about two or three of these creatures in the unoccupied squares in that grid when they would come up. So that's enough. Uh, that is enough to uh, add extra enemies on the board, but not so many that it's going to overwhelm the party. And because those things only have one hit point each, it's, once they figure out they only have one hit point, it would be very easy to get rid of them with a very minor um, damage but they still each get one attack every round and if they hit they do something like 2d6 damage so it's just an extra little you know punch of damage coming at the party from these little things until they choose to deal with them all right so now i got to the legendary actions what were the legendary actions that i was going to give where you say the falling star I only swapped out one legendary action, and in this case, I allow the dragon a little bit mobili of mobility by using that teleport through stone as one of its legendary actions. So that means that at the end of another creature's turn on every round, it could either uh, do a tail attack, teleport through stone or do a wing attack and of course it only gets three of those legendary actions so it can 
you know, what it wound up doing is it wound up in the first round, it wound up teleporting two times and basically made people start trying to chase it around until they remembered, oh, yeah, we got to get it off of the stone. And once they did that, okay, then it stopped the teleporting. Uh, and um, that, you know, that reminded them that you better you better find a way of dealing with this or else this guy is just going to hop all over the battlefield until he gets you in a position that he wants you and um he's going to um uh, you know take you out one by one um uh, and then the tail attack of course which uh i was surprised to learn a tail attack for an adult dragon in D&D 5th edition doesn't have a chance to knock you prone. I mean, you think a full-grown dragon, and you think kind of a thick, meaty tail being whipped around like that, it's like you would think you should have to make some kind of either strength check or dexterity check to avoid being knocked over. But it's not in the rules. So uh, we were even... People were even asking about that during the game. Uh, the players were saying... Uh, do I need to worry about being knocked prone by this tail? And I was like, well, let me see. Well, it doesn't say so. Well, let me just make sure I didn't screw something up. So I went to the monster manual. I looked at it. Nope. 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 No chance of getting knocked prone. All right. So then the actions. Uh, the, the actions I largely left uh, intact with the exception that I I tweaked the fire breath a little bit, uh, and I tweaked the bite a little bit. So uh, I changed that splash damage on the bite to be a to be both fire and necrotic. Now, 5e, when you're playing it strictly by the book, there are very few things, if any. I don't know if. I don't know if there's anything I've seen so far in 5th edition out of a published source that has um, that has both uh, that has two different types of damage on its uh, uh, on its uh, you know attack type. So in this case, I wanted to give that breath weapon and the bite, both fire and necrotic tags on the damage type. So that means that unless you make a save, you have to have resistance to both fire and necrotic in order to reduce that um, splash damage uh, or re reduce the um, fire breath damage. And that turned out to be a critical oversight on a couple of the parties, on a couple of the party members, I I did give them an opportunity to learn that this was the case, and I gave them you know several chances to think about. Well, do you want to do anything? Are you sure you guys are ready? Are you sure you're ready? And they were like, "Yep, we think we're ready. We we've got." And, and they were mainly focused on what they could do to attack and hurt the dragon. Um, if there was anything they failed to take into account, it was this, uh, it was this second damage type that uh, the dragon could deal out with its breath weapon. So I did a, uh, I did a little bit of a tweak on that shadow breath capability. So, uh, a humanoid that's reduced to zero hit points by this damage dies, and an undead magman rises from its corpse and acts immediately after where you say in the initiative count, um, the corpse does also dissolves to ash. So the magman is under the dragon's control, and then I said after one hour, the undead magman returns to either the Shadowfell or the elemental plane of fire. Any humanoid so transformed or transported must be resurrected from the plane on which the magman resides. So that was something that I said, okay, if they wind up losing party members, I don't want, I don't want them to, you know, have like, okay, Totally gone. Absolutely no chance of ever getting the 
uh, character back. But I did want to make it potentially kind of interesting. If if they lost party members and somehow they weren't able to do anything about these magmen for an hour or they outright killed the magmen, well then their party member, they would have to travel to the Shadowfell or travel to the Elemental Plane of Fire to go find their party member and try to resurrect them. So that would at the very least be an extra detour that they would have to make in the campaign. And I thought that could pose some interesting uh, choices in case they wanted to do that. Now, they figured out that those things would last, would stay around for an hour. So that what they wound up doing is they wound up dealing some dual damage to them, knocking them to zero. And then I gave them sort of a uh, sort of a wink and a nod with several powerful allies in Kamigawa that could basically uh, resurrect their um, their party members by having the uh, remains of the magmen. Uh, or the the uh, uh, subdued magman there, and that would allow them to bring the uh, PCs bodies back if they wanted to, if they wanted to in fact do that. All right. Uh, so now here's the two monsters we've been talking about with the breath. This top monster is uh, the breath of Rayuse. Uh, up here, that's the uh, that's the token that I gave the those things that were created uh, by the breath of Rayuse in an unoccupied square. Uh, that artwork is actually from the uh, from the Earthshaker, which is a monster out of Magic the Gathering Champions of Kamigawa expansion. So it's a one hit point, and it does, I think, like it has one attack, and it does something like uh, 2d6 bludgeoning damage. You know, so, uh, and it disappears if you say is slain or redu reduced to zero hit points. Uh, and then the Magman, I just use the standard Magman uh, artwork out of D&D 5th edition. Because those things, those things are elemental creatures, but they kind of look... a they kind of look a little bit creepy, like they're kind of undead anyway. So I just said, all right, since this guy has something of the shadow template, I'll just give like a little nod to that and throw, um, you know, make it an undead elemental. I don't know that an undead elemental actually exists anywhere in the rules, but in my game it exists. And I'm the kind of DM that I take the rules as general guidelines and um, sort of do what I want with them. But at least, at least they, at least they give me, they give me borders, and I can choose to color within the lines if I want to. Uh, I'll put it that way. Um, and I think, I think most DMs after a while, that's what they wind up doing anyway. It's like, eh, yeah, that, that's not as much fun. Um, I think this is cooler, so I'm gonna do this. And sometimes those ideas wind up being really cool, and sometimes those ideas wind up being, what the hell was I thinking? But in this case, uh, it worked out being pretty cool. So uh, I told you before that I wanted to make this a super challenging fight, and it really turned out that way. So the, the cleric is a forge cleric, uh, that's the uh, cleric uh, archetype or the cleric path that he's taken is the forge cleric. And he's also a warforged. So by being, by virtue of being a forge cleric, he has resistance to fire. He doesn't have complete immunity to fire yet at this level, but he has resistance to fire. So he was thinking, um, I think I'm going to be okay. And the... Barbarian is a slightly modified, slightly homebrew uh, uh, totem of the bear, Barbarian. So he gets, when he goes into his rage, he gets resistance to every type of damage that is not psychic damage. And he did then go and later buy 
and a magic item that gives him resistance to psychic damage. So literally, when he rages, he has resistance to every type of damage that any monster can throw at him. Uh, which is good because he is designed to be the party's tank. He is designed to be the one that goes in and is always face-to-face, toe-to-toe with the biggest, baddest monster on the board. And so you want him to be focused, you know, getting the focus and getting the brunt of all of the monster's physical attacks. And in order to withstand that, he kind of has to be able to mitigate some of that, um, some of that damage coming in. Now, the dragon wound up being able to breathe three times in a five round fight because it took five rounds for the party to knock the dragon down and the uh, first time it breathed i actually forgot about his uh, breath of rayuse monsters so i didn't even make the rolls and check to see if any of those popped up on the board and it probably was a good thing that i did in the way that the way the fight went but then, uh, uh, and I think everybody that was everybody that was in the line of fire for that uh, breath weapon, everybody made their save the first time. So they all took half damage, or in the case of the barbarian who made his save, took quarter damage from the uh, from the breath weapon. But the uh, then on the fourth round, when he got to breathe the second time, then I did remember to do the uh, Breath of Rayuse monsters. And at that point in time, the cleric, this Warforged cleric, well, he failed his, his saving throw against the Breath Weapon. And he was thinking he was going to be okay, but he forgot that that damage is also typed as necrotic. And he doesn't have a way of dealing with necrotic. So because he didn't, he took the full damage from that breath weapon. He also wound up having uh, getting hit a couple of times during the fight by that tail. And um, so between the tail damage and that breath weapon damage, he wound up being dropped to zero hit points in the fourth round. And a, an undead magman popped up in his place. And that's when the rest of the party went, oh, crap, we might be in trouble. And uh, then on the fifth round, the dragon's breath weapon recharged again. And so two rounds in a row, he got to breathe. And that's when the bard went down from that breath weapon. Uh, Because I think the the bard may have made all of her saving throws, but... She got hit by the breath weapon twice and got hit by several other attacks uh, along the way as well. I think she got smacked by the tail once. Um, So that meant we had two of these undead magmans on the board, uh, a couple of these breath of Rayuse monsters, and we were down to party members. So now the dragon... And its allies outnumbered the remaining party members. Uh, fortunately, by that time, the the dragon was extremely low on hit points. Uh, the barbarian hit it with a mighty blow, but didn't quite knock it all the way to zero. And it was actually left up to the monk to come in. The monk had had some... Uh, had some arrows and they found arrows that would do uh, psychic damage and arrows that would do radiant damage so he had been standing back and out of breath weapon range and firing those but he was rolling horribly on his uh on his attacks and he kept i think like three out of three out of the four rounds that he fired with the arrow, he missed his attacks, or he missed at least one attack, because he gets two attacks with the bow at this level. And uh, he was missing at least one arrow on every round. So then finally, just out of of frustration, the player says, okay, I've just seen my best friend, this cleric, die. 
I've seen my companion, the bard, die. I throw down the bow, and I just use my winged boots and go right up there in this dragon's grill, and I'm going to just start punching him. And by that time, he didn't he didn't realize it, but by that time, the dragon was down to single-digit hit points. So it was like the second punch that the, um, the monk threw was enough to drop the dragon to zero hit points. But when he did drop... Uh, I think everybody in the party had sustained some damage. Uh, the 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 monk may have stayed out of range enough and not gotten hit by any of the breath weapons, but the barbarian who has over a hundred hit points uh, was down to like close to ten hit points by the time this dragon fell. So it it very nearly took out half the party. And that's the kind of thing I wanted this to be. I wanted this to feel like if they won this battle, I wanted the party to feel like they really earned this victory. That it was not that it was not something that had been built up as this big epic fight and was just a cakewalk. Um and by the same token, I didn't want it to be something that it was built up that they had to do. And then when they got there, it was like, you know, showing up with a rowboat and trying to fight the Death Star. You know, it, <laughs> I didn't want them to be uh, to be completely overwhelmed and and outmatched. But that's kind of the way I uh, wound up setting up this fight and the way that it turned out. It was a it was a fun battle, and it was a really cool build of a monster. But like I say, it's so specific to my game and the characters that my players have created and the way they have evolved those characters that this would not necessarily be a good fit for anybody else's game. You know, There may be a lot of DMs out there that would think, oh, man... You know, my character, my characters are a lot more powerful than that. This would be, you know, way too easy. I'd have to, you know, I'd have to tweak some of these abilities and make them even tougher, or give it more hit points, or, uh, you know, make it have, make it be able to create more minions. You know, more ways of creating minions that it that it could throw at the at the PCs or give it spell casting or something like that. And that's fine because in those games uh, you may need that. And then there are other DMs that might be looking at it and said, holy cow, you're throwing this at a party of eighth level characters. That's insane. You know, they would, they would, you know, an eighth level party in my game wouldn't even be a speed bump against this thing. And, in my other games that I run, like in my Thursday night game, which is a by the book, very much by the book game where we're sort of meandering through the storylines of the fifth edition uh, published campaigns from Wizards of the Coast. Indeed, this dragon probably would take an eighth level party like that and go, these guys are nothing, and just sort of pull over them and keep going without without batting an eye. Um, but, you know, the players in the Sunday game, the planeswalking game, they are working towards being planeswalkers, so their characters are evolving over time, and they are getting more and more and more customized as they go along, as they gain levels, they gain different things that are not part of the standard 5th edition rules, because that emulates these players becoming more planeswalkers and having to face all of these monsters that come out of the Magic the Gathering game, that have all of these synergistic abilities, uh, all these things like that when one monster does this, it makes all the other monsters more powerful or gives all the other monsters additional powers or, or things of that nature. So that's the kind of game we're in, and that means that the characters have to be a little bit more robust than uh, the way the standard 5th edition rules allow. All right, so uh, that is going to just about do it. 
uh, for our discussion of Rayuse. Uh, I'm going to check the chat and see if we have any questions. Hey, Skyland. Hey, Amish. Good to see you guys. Uh, yeah, Pete did kind of walk into that. <laughs> he, he, he got right in the way of that uh, breath weapon on the fourth round and boop, down went the cleric. All right. Uh, ah. Yes, uh, Amish asks in the chat, so to resist for dual damage types, uh, you would have to be able to resist both fire and necrotic. Yes, you would. Uh, that is that is something that was a thing. I think it was in 3rd edition D&D and possibly in 4th edition as well, where they there were quite a few uh, there were quite a few spells or uh, monsters or whatever that the entirety of their damage was two damage types. The closest that you see in 5th uh, edition is you see uh, things like where I think there are certain spells, I want to say, I forget what the name of the spell is, but it's one of the higher level, it's a higher level version of uh, Moonbeam, I think, which is where it does something like a total of 10d6 damage, but 5d6 of that is cold and 5d6 of that is radiant. Uh, so that... Uh, that gives you um, that gives you both damage types, but because it's splitting the damage pool, if you have resistance to one, then you can resist half the damage and you take all of the rest of the damage. I wanted this to be a little bit different, where you had to have resistance to both types to resist any of it. All right, how would that work if someone was immune to one? Again, because all of the damage is both types, having immunity, like say immunity to fire, wouldn't do you any good. If you had immunity to fire, had no way of mitigating necrotic, and you failed your saving throw, you're going to take all of the damage. Now, another DM might choose to follow the 5th edition template on some of those spells and say, okay... Total damage for a dragon of this category is 16d6. So I am going, or 16d8, whatever it is. Uh, let me let me go back and take a look. 16d6. Uh, uh, so what they might do is another DM might say 8d6 of that is necrotic, 8d6 of that is fire. So then in a case that you were asking about, if somebody was immune to fire damage and wasn't immune to necrotic damage and they failed their saving throw, well they would take the 8d6 that was necrotic and they would just totally ignore the 8d6 that was uh, fire. Okay. Uh, yeah, so and then, and then the same thing. If you're immune to one type, resistant to the other type and you fail your saving throw, you take half of the damage that you are uh, resistant to. If you make your saving throw, then you take a quarter of the damage that you're resistant to, and you completely ignore the other damage. Uh, if you break it up in the way that 5th edition often does. I just, like I said, I like being a little bit different. And I like posing a little bit more of a challenge to the uh, to the players, and so by just making all of the damage both types, that means that that means that resistance to one is not good enough. And the Forge Cleric, I think when they get to, I think when they get to something like uh, tier three, so it might be somewhere around 11th or 12th or maybe 13th level, they eventually get complete immunity to fire damage. 
Um, but again, if they face this dragon at that level, immunity to fire wouldn't do them any good. Unless I changed the way the damage was split up on that breath weapon. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you, Skyland. Uh, it was a little bit of a tricky twist, uh, and I did think it wound up being a great story. Because what I did is, is, like I said, I gave... I didn't tell them that there was going to be this pathway, but I had, I had realized that there was a good chance that one or more of the players would drop to zero and would actually die, and... I wanted to make it then be the choice of the player if their character exited the game and they started a new character or if, you know, if they got that character back and could continue. So what I did is, is I had set up something um, off screen that they, those guys didn't know about where if any of the players fell and the party still prevailed, then the other four spirit guardians, the other four dragons that had actually asked them to go and cleanse this um, this corrupted dragon, they would come and they would help along with uh, the cleansed Ryusei to basically help resurrect the um, party members that had fallen. And because these are hugely powerful spirit guardians of a realm doesn't sound like that's something out of the out of the capability of creatures like that to do it sounds like yeah okay yeah i mean there's these big huge spirit guardians tied to the different land types they probably have that capability and i'm not going to worry too much about the mechanics of how that works but uh what i what it wound up allowing me to do is it wound up allowing me to let the bard and the uh cleric each have a nice afterlife scene so they actually went into the afterlife and i i gave them a lot of leeway i asked them i said okay what is the warforged afterlife like and let them describe it to me and then i just sort of would prompt them or i would pick up beats in what they told me and then let them talk about what they saw and what was there and all that kind of stuff and then I uh, did the same thing for the bard, who's a minotaur. And I said, okay, so what's the minotaur afterlife like? And um, so they got to do those stories. And then it came to a point where each of them was given a choice by the deity that they followed. And basically standing at the fork of two paths. And one path, they could see their friends and see uh, these big spirit guardians on one path and on the other path they could see kind of all of their friends and family uh, and forebears who had gone before them and they could choose to go that way and I left it up to them and I waited until we were in the game to have them tell me okay are you going back or are you not going back? And I knew what was going to happen if they if they did. And I kind of had an idea what was going to happen if they didn't. But they both ultimately wound up choosing to return to the game with those characters. And then they also both chose, which was an option, they chose to take a lasting battle scar. Uh, a permanent scar from this battle that um, their character would always carry as a reminder of what had happened. And uh, so that kind of gives a, a nice little memento uh, to that character that can come up in future RP sessions. Well, hey, you know, uh, where, did that, where did that discoloration in your armor come from? Uh, oh, well, that was because of blah, 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 blah. Or, wow, those those horns don't look like any other Minotaur horns I've ever seen. What's the story with those? Oh, well, these are prosthetic horns because I lost my horns in this giant battle. And uh, they would get to tell the story of that uh, to NPCs. 
So, uh, so would you would I have done that if it was a TPK? <sighs> If it was a TPK, I would have. I, I think that would have ended the story in Kamigawa. It wouldn't have ended the campaign, but it would would have ended the story in Kamigawa, and the uh, the party would then, you know, I would ask the I would ask the players. If they wanted to bring their characters back, um, and if they did, I'd probably have to figure out where they would come back. And then, yeah, uh, if they all wanted to bring their characters back, I probably would have done that that afterlife scene with every single one of them. And then that would have meant that their their sponsors, uh, basically the people who sent them on the the overarching task that they're on either from Waterdeep or from Ravnica would have had to figure out what happened to them and then would have had to go to either the Shadowfell or to the uh, Plane of Fire and find them and bring them back. And the characters themselves would probably wind up waking up either in Ravnica or or in Waterdeep, which are kind of the two bases uh, that they operate from. So I probably would have had it be something like a, uh, for those of you of a certain age who've read the books, uh, if you remember the the original, uh, what is it, Fellowship of the Ring, from the Lord of the Rings, where uh, Frodo gets attacked by the... Uh, by the shadows on, on as they're about to get to Rivendell and you know he puts on the ring and he sees all the shadowy forms and then he gets attacked and uh, everything goes black and the next thing he knows he's waking up in Elrond's house uh, that's probably the kind of thing that I would have had that I would have done physically for the players but it would have been nice to give them all this uh, this afterlife scene if they need it but Quite frankly, if it had come to a TPK, I would know that I had done the battle wrong. Uh, that would have been a poorly designed battle on my part. Because uh, it wasn't designed to be a TPK. It was designed to be something that would remind them that their, play, that their characters are susceptible to death. And give them a good scare. Uh, of of the fact that they can lose their characters and that this is a really super dangerous uh, campaign. And, you know, they've, they've had fights before where one or more of them have gone to zero hit points during the battle. They almost always are able to get the character back up during the battle and get them back in the fight before the end of the battle. But they have never experienced every th anything where one of the active PCs dies. I did have a situation where one player had to leave the game, and uh, realizing that that player wasn't coming back, and realizing there was a way I could forward the plot of the antagonist of the entire campaign... I actually had that character get murdered off screen and then the rest of the party wound up having to go solve that that PC's murder. So that was a PC that wasn't going to be coming back into the game no matter what because the player had left the game. But it gave me an opportunity to do something with that character instead of, oh, well, they just wander off into the sunset and never, never heard from again. So... Uh, that is, uh, that, oh, well, thank you, Skyland. Uh, yeah, it, uh, but, well, like I said, uh, I have, I've, I've watched, I've played enough D&D &D to know a 
bad encounter when I'm in one. I have watched enough uh, D&D Online and uh, heard enough D&D podcasts to hear other DMs talk about, yeah, that was a poorly designed encounter because that should not have happened in that way. Uh, and when I was putting this together, it's like uh, I gave them the opportunity to find out all of this creature's abilities before they went into the fight. And then to their credit, they spent like two weeks trying to figure out how they were going to prepare to fight this this battle, which was really good. I was very proud of them because a lot of times they're like, oh, it's a big enemy. Well, let's just you know armor up and go and, and fight it. And it's like, oh, okay, hope they don't try that with this one because it might end poorly. But uh, as, it, as it turns out, I gave them enough. I gave it enough vulnerabilities and gave them enough tools that they were able to piece together how to beat that puzzle, even though it was a costly victory uh, for the uh, for the group. Uh, but yeah, I think uh, I think that I think that made it. I think that makes D and D really fun when occasionally you have these battles that really push you to the limit. I do think it gets a bit old if that's all you ever have. If you if you constantly feel like your like your player or like your characters are in danger of dying, then you can start to get a little a little bit of anxiety because it makes it feel like you're playing something like Call of Cthulhu in that case, where where the conceit in Call of Cthulhu is, well, you know, all of the characters gonna are going to die at some point. It's just a matter of when, and it's a matter of how long they're gonna they're going to uh, ask. So yeah. Oh okay. Uh yeah. Well, good, Skylin. I'm glad that you're. Glad you're finding these uh, sessions useful. Uh, hope you're uh, finding some uh, things that you can incorporate uh, from watching the streams. And I'm sure you're finding some things that, oh, yep, I don't want to do that uh, <laughs> from watching the streams. But that's that's good. You know, it's like uh, we, uh, as a DM, you'll find yourself very probably... Uh, because most DMs will freely admit to this, uh, they will find themselves stealing the things that they like from other DMs and ignoring or staying away from the things that they feel like doesn't work from other DMs. And it's a great it's a great way of doing that. So we're all kind of like jazz musicians in that standpoint. It's like, oh yeah, that's a cool riff. I'm going to take that riff and work it into my own song. Ooh, yeah. Ooh, that didn't sound good. Not gonna play that. Uh, <laughs> all right. Ah, okay, cool. Uh, good, Skylin. I'm glad you are able to use some goblins. All right, everybody. Uh, I think that's about the end of the questions. Thank you so much for uh, hanging out tonight. And um, I am going to go ahead and go into the. Uh, go into the wrap-up. I have been DM Galabond. The uh, game that I created this monster for is the Walker of Waterdeep game. That's the Planeswalking game, Sunday afternoon, 2 p.m. Eastern. I also run uh, two other games. There's the 5th uh, edition Sword Coast Chronicles game, uh, Thursdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, and the uh, Greyhawk 2nd uh, edition game, which we are now in the middle of character creation for that game on Saturday nights at 7.30 p.m. You can find all of those games live on Twitch. Archives of all of those games over on YouTube. Also on YouTube, you will find uh, a couple of videos that I put up every week during the midweek. I'm right now during doing a series on... Uh, the Adventures Out of Candlekeep Mysteries. Uh, 
how you could run each of those mysteries uh, or each of those adventures as a separate adventure and uh, then how you can tease out little bits and pieces of those uh, adventures to use in other settings or other homebrew games. And then at the end of that series, I will I will talk about one idea for doing an entire campaign out of that book, out of the Candlekeep Mysteries book. So uh, even though it's not designed to be a single campaign that you play through, I think there is a way of doing that. And in fact, I, I'm trying to narrow down which one I want to do because I've already thought about three or four different ways of doing that. And I'm sure the deeper I get into this series, the more ways I will discover or the more campaign ideas I will come up with. All right, well, that's going to do it. Let me go ahead and bring up the music in the background, and then I'm going to look for a uh, game that we can raid on Twitch. All right, so let's go. Uh, the, the others. All right, so let's see. All right. Uh, looks like we have. Uh, Hillary is doing some team fight tactics. So let's go ahead and we'll raid Hailry. And all right. All right, thank you everybody for coming and hanging out tonight. Uh hope you have a wonderful week and we hope we'll see you back next week for Another edition of Monster Monday. Good night, everyone. <laughs>